Hi, Maggie. Hi, um, I'm Maggie Kurt Baker. I am the science editor at boingboing.net um, and a science journalist for magazines and websites. And I'm Jessica Campbell. I am a blogger at the science blog Last Word on Nothing, and I'm the author of The Siesta in the Midnight Sun. Uh, well, it's really great to get a chance to meet you. I know I've wanted to meet you for ages. It's been I've been reading Boing Boing forever, so I was thrilled oh, to see a science person on there that's dedicated. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. I have checked out some of the stuff on uh, your blog recently, and really am looking forward to reading your uh, your new book. I haven't got a chance to yet, but it's on my list. I think um, I think we're actually sending it to you. So, <laughs> oh, oh, super! That's even that's even better. Um, I was going to first off, you had mentioned that you had an experience in Japan a couple of years ago with a uh, smaller disaster at the Fukushima nuclear plant site, and I wanted to find out some more that, about that because. We've written a lot about that on Boing Boing, and Shani, one of my editors, just got back from Japan and from visiting the, uh, going inside the actual controlled zone around Fukushima. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. She went in there with some of the guys from SafeCast that are doing crowdsourced um, Geiger counter measurements, and also with Miles O'Brien from PBS, and they have gotten a couple of stories that are going to run, I think, on... Boing Boing and on PBS NewsHour, but I'd never heard about this previous incident that you mentioned, and I'd love to find out some more about that. That's right. It was actually at the Takaimura uh, processing plant where they um, synthesized some of the fuels, and it, but you know, in the same the same program. And at the time, it was the the worst uh, nuclear um, radiation disaster that Japan had had experienced in its program. Um, six, more than 660 people were exposed, whether that was workers and nearby residents, to uh, higher than safe levels of radiation. So it was a big deal at the time, but it's sort of been lost in the radar. And to me, it was a demonstration of really the, um, the safety difficulties that they were having and the, mm. um, and the problems with their, uh, perhaps their, their, uh, just the the system and the and the fail safes that they seem to be shortcutting. Basically, I got there um, to spend a year in Japan at Kyoto University as a foreign student, and I went up to Fukushima Prefecture where my friend Ian was um, was teaching English. Just for a week before school started, it was the end of September, and school there starts in October, and so I spent. The first night in Japan I spent there, and then I woke up the next morning and sort of biked around with Ian around town and got introduced to the, the rice paddies and the mountains and the Shinkansen and everything, um, kind of biking in the rain. And we got back and turned on the television, and there were just these men in white suits hmm. filing into a building and behind this cordoned off uh, area. And we didn't really wow. understand. We understood maybe one in ten Japanese words that were happening on TV, but there was this sense that something was happening and we should probably know about it. And so I called my dad. He turned on CNN, and very unhelpfully, they had put on a documentary on Chernobyl at that time. Oh, so whether that was topical because they were actually covering the story or just a a weird coincidence, like the implications were very disturbing. And my dad, uh, who's a physicist himself, was just sort of like, you know, close the windows and stay inside until we know what is happening here. And what in fact had happened was that there were three workers who were making a small batch of fuel for a reactor and they were under considerable time pressure. And so instead hmm. of using the, the equipment and the measurement, the measurement uh, systems that were supposed to be in place, they were mixing their enriched uranium in uh, solutions in these uh, 10 deciliter buckets and then pouring it directly into um, the tank 
that not not the buffer tank that was designed to avoid criticality, but um, but directly into the mixture. And so after about the seventh bucket that they poured in, having had no training on this particular uh, type of fuel, that for, it was a, an experimental reactor that was the first batch of fuel for this particular reactor that they had made in three years. Um, they just saw this massive blue light flashing, which is oh. Cherenkov uh, radiation. Yeah. And one of them was leaning over the tank at the time. Another was just holding this sort of mixing funnel. And, um, and those two uh, later died a few months later. Um, they immediately felt nauseous and, and in pain and just had trouble yeah. breathing. And I mean, very, very immediate uh, circus. And then later collapsed in decontamination and you know, vomiting and all the rest of it. Um, and just very disturbing situation. And so it was, it was also interesting to see how the government handled it and how the information kept changing about what they knew and, um, and, and what they, dare I say, admit. I mean, it really did seem like they were mm -hmm. trying to calm people without necessarily having that real basis for that assurance. Um, right. And what year was that? That was in 1999. Okay. So right afterwards, you know, they, we had the Y2K scare in the, when the millennium hit, and we were hearing all these rumors about how France was shutting down its nuclear system just in case there was a glitch. And uh, Japan was just sort of putting an extra shift of workers on their nuclear sites just to kind of if something went wrong, they could troubleshoot in double time or something. And, and we were all very nervous after that. Oh, my God, I imagine. What is interesting to me about that is, like, what you're saying about the government trying to calm people yeah. without, without the right information or without any information it seems like the inverse but equal problem of what I see in the media a lot of stirring up fear without the right information. That's right. That, it wasn't alarmist at all. Yeah. Yeah. That you, it, it's interesting that it's interesting to me that you kind of get the same problem, but on different kind of flip sides of the coin, you know, you can either have this alarmist reaction or this inaccurate calming reaction, <laughs> but in either case, people don't actually know what's going on. Exactly, and they can't make decisions that are rational based on it. So you just, I mean, you just want to know, should I leave my house? Should I go somewhere right. else? Like, just tell me and I'll do it, right? <laughs> I'm not going right, to, you know, yeah. I'm not in the business of judging someone for what they've done wrong. I just, I would rather be healthy right now. <laughs> well, that's one of the interesting things that um, Chenny was telling me about is that some of the big problems that they've had in Japan with this most recent issue was that the government was telling people to, you know, this isn't going to be a problem, you don't need to worry about it, and then suddenly started telling people, oh, you need to take off right now at a time when they really should have just been staying in their houses and mm. leaving later. Okay. And so they basically told everybody, get out of the house and go now, right at the time that it was the worst for them to get out of the house oh, no. at all. And, and, and of course, in Japan, I mean, you have a historical basis for real mistrust of anything nuclear. And so, you right. know, I mean, there are feelings that this stirs up that are, you know, really quite powerful. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember one of the other stories that Shani told me about an old woman that had stopped and spoken to them when they had stopped in a town just outside of the uh, exclusion zone. And she had told them about how right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, the people that had been hurt by those, by the nuclear, by the radiation from those incidents had been shunned because people thought, well, I can maybe get contaminated from mm -hmm. talking to or having anything to do with these people. And there was a big social aspect to, you know, it wasn't just about their physical health, it became about their mental health as well. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's, 
bad enough trying to understand microscopic germs, but radiation is really a very counterintuitive uh, phenomenon, and and its effect on the body is you know not something that most of us understand. I'm not sure that I fully understand it, and I you know I've actually taken some time to look into it. But I mean that kind of leads us into something that you had mentioned um, to me before this, which was that there is a way of measuring the the current levels at Fukushima from the Californian atmosphere. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I actually just finished um, posting a story to one point about that, and it ended up being really interesting because it wasn't, like the paper that was published wasn't about what I thought it was. Oh, okay. I had read the abstract of the paper and the press release. Um, So the paper is basically these researchers in Southern California have been measuring um, radioactive sulfur in the atmosphere since 2009, I believe. And they saw on their extremely sensitive monitoring equipment, you know, an uptick in uh, the number of particles that they were detecting, uh, I believe, I want to say a week after, um, after the Fukushima disaster happened. And so they were able to kind of know this is where this came from, and then extrapolate back, this is the amount of radioactive sulfur that must have been put out in Fukushima to get this amount that we got in California based on what the uh, meteorological conditions at the time and how long it traveled across the Pacific. So they were able to kind of trace back and say, you know, this is the amount of radiation that was coming out of these damaged nuclear reactors. But, you know, other people have done that in the months since then and have kind of used other similar markers to trace back to Fukushima. What ended up being really interesting about this particular study was that it wasn't about nuclear power at all. It was actually about coal. Um, The researchers have been studying uh, radioactive sulfur because it is part of studying um, ozone. Okay. And they have been tracing how these things move from the upper atmosphere down into the lower atmosphere where we live. And they're both things that can uh, affect human health, particularly ozone. Uh, but they also end up interacting with pollution because both ozone and sulfur, non-radioactive sulfur, are um, part of air pollution down here in the lower atmosphere. Yeah. And so what happened in the upper atmosphere flows down in and it has, you know, it interacts with what we have down here already and increases the effect of that. But then it also tells them something about, you know, how the stuff from down here moves around mm. uh, the planet. So you, how you get ozone from Los Angeles affecting people hundreds of miles away. Um, so that's what they've been studying. I didn't and realize that it, it so whatever you put in the upper atmosphere necessarily flows down because you hear about these geoengineering (coughs) proposals with that you put sulfur dioxide up in the atmosphere and it'll start shielding, you know. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Right. And if this is, this is the sulfur dioxide actually comes in and is really important here. Um, because yeah, sulfur dioxide does counteract, uh, temperature increases. So you have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and those work to trap heat against the planet. And then you have particulate matter, um, including sulfur dioxide, and that ends up working to block heat from the sun. So it it cools, but greenhouse gases warm up, and they kind of work against each other, even though when you're talking about man-made versions, they're both coming from the same place, um, which is fossil fuel emissions. Right. Um, But you have this... So that means that, you know, as we in Western countries have started um, cleaning our smokestacks, uh, you know, doing clean coal projects over the last 20 or 30 years, we've greatly reduced the amount of sulfur dioxide that we put out. And that has affected the amount of the temperature going up uh, because that sulfur dioxide masks the effects of the greenhouse gases. So what everybody's trying to understand right now is what will happen when places like China start putting in air quality protections and start scrubbing out that sulfur dioxide (laughs) themselves. 
the horror, uh, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very ironic yeah. thing because on the one hand, you're saving lives in the short term. On the other hand, you're getting these bigger temperature increases. Um, and so tracking sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is actually really important to understanding how, uh, you know, a coal plant in China affects the global climate system. But that's really hard to do because if you think about all of the sulfur dioxide emissions coming out all over the world every day, it's hard to say, you know, this one factory, what does it contribute and actually understand how the movement of those, uh, of, you know, of those molecules happens. Uh, and what this Fukushima paper was able to do is provide a marker where enough sulfur was being put out that it was a big enough signal to stand out from the noise. So this is the first time that somebody's been able to say, here is a source of sulfur. Mm -hmm. We know exactly how much came out. We know not exactly, but we have a really good estimate of how much came out. We know exactly when it came out, and we know when it got to the United States and how much it was when it got here. So we can use that to actually look at what's happening in China and understand that a lot better. Yeah, it's a bit of a Rosetta Stone because once you have, it, it yeah, reminds me of sort of when exactly. you first saw, you know, you can see the Great Wall of China from the moon or whatever it is and, you know, you, you can, the human effects are, are suddenly coming out from, I guess all of the, because I would imagine a lot of the sulfur comes from, you know, spontaneously igniting coal mountains and everything like that. I mean, it's not, it's not just our, our plants, but it's right. like, you know, bituminous soil and all the rest. And yeah, it would be really a nightmare to find the signal in that noise. Right, exactly. Because you've got, you've got the natural background, you've got the anthropogenic background. Right. How do you pick out one thing? I mean, it, it's like being surrounded by a bunch of symphonies and trying to tell what one flutist is playing. Yeah. Um, but this one study is going to make that a lot easier. Interesting. You had another yeah. sort of uh, global warming topic that you've been looking at as well? Yeah, um, last week, or a couple weeks ago actually, I did a piece about um, climate change and earthquakes. And that was really interesting because it was something that I had also heard a lot about um, right after the earthquake that led to the Fukushima disaster. Um, I had seen a lot of uh, environmental blogs talking about this possible link. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know more about that because it sounded, you know, it's sort of implausible. Um, you know, how can that, what happens in the atmosphere possibly affect the movement of tectonic plates? Mm -hmm. um, and what I ended up finding out was that what happens on the, it's not about the atmosphere so much as it is about weight on the surface of the planet. Yeah. Um, that we already know that when you build large reservoirs, for instance, that that can actually trigger um, earthquakes. There was a specific incident in um, India in the 1960s where they built a very large reservoir in an area that had been chosen because it was not very seismically active. But after the reservoir was built, it became noticeably seismically active. And that's because where the weight is and where it isn't. So adding weight or removing weight can affect whether or not these, you know, the stresses between plate boundaries mm -hmm. actually break or whether, you know, they stay locked together for a little while longer. Um, and that ends up being connected back to climate change because as ice caps melt and as ice pack and glaciers melt in the Arctic, that's changing the weight distribution in those regions. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of speculation that it could end up triggering earthquakes in those regions, and they have actually seen, um, I believe, some increases in earthquakes in Alaska and around Greenland um, in the last, I think, 10 or 15 years. Um, but none of that is tied into the kind of large earthquakes far away from the pole that Right. the kind of thing that was in Japan, that has nothing to do with this. It's these smaller things that happen more locally to where the weight distribution changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, I wonder if it 
intensifies or just accelerates or makes more frequent you know what I mean like what in what way it increases the earthquakes and um, yeah and they don't they don't know a whole lot about that yet um, what it is what they do know is that it doesn't necessarily cause earthquakes um, but it can maybe trigger one sooner than it would have otherwise happened okay um, and that they're often earthquakes that would be on the smaller side, um, relatively speaking. So, you know, things less than seven uh, on the scale would be something that you might think of as possibly being caused by weight distribution changes. Um, larger earthquakes than that, they tell me, are usually always just tectonic plate issues. Right, because the force, of, you know, from, from below has got to be... A more significant, right? One. And I did a little bit of scanning around for that, and and I came across the phenomenon of ice quakes, which sort of made oh interesting quite a lot of sense to me because when you think about ice on the on the sort of glacial scale, it's not unlike tectonic plates floating on magma, right? It's sort of this oh um, so you know when they when they shift against each other, they're there's essentially earthquakes on that level, and the rising and falling of the water levels will af affect that as well, and sometimes create more calving and more uh, breaking off of shelves and so on. Oh, really? So you can get like you know two glaciers next to each other and have that same sort of plate boundary action that you get with tectonic plates. Well, yeah. I mean, it just makes you think in this fashion where because glac glaciers clearly oh. flow as as a liquid, in the same way that glass is actually kind right. of flowing, and but then you start thinking of everything in those terms, and it just it's a bit of a head trip. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, it the, totally is. The first earthquake that I experienced in Japan, and I was just it just felt like a train was coming through the room, and I mean it wasn't hmm. it wasn't anything significant, but the the little girl that I was teaching English to at the time, she ran to the TV and she knew just what channel to go to and it'll show a little, automatically it shows you where the epicenter is and it's all very exciting. Um, but there's this realization that the, the world is, is alive beneath you at, at all times. Mm. You know, you're living on this, yeah. on this living creature kind of thing. And it was very profoundly... Well, I'm sure I've lost sight of that actual realization because you can't walk around all the time realizing that. But at the time, right. you know, it was really, um, it was quite a different, it was a switch in perspective. Oh, God, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm from the Midwest. I'm used to tornadoes. I've never oh, experienced wow. tornadoes. I can't imagine tornadoes. It, oh, they're, it, they're nothing. <laughs> you know, like, we... I mean, well, they're not nothing, but, you know, you get, you get so, I guess, numb okay. to the fact that they're there. Like, you know, I know people from California who just won't even miss a beat if there's a little trembler. And it's the same kind of thing with tornadoes. You know, I grew up with my brothers and my stepbrothers and my cousins going out onto the porch when the tornado siren went off because you wanted to see what you could see in the sky. <laughs> And did it, did it, were you ever kind of in the eye of one? Um, I was in grade school when a tornado um, tore up a chunk of Topeka, uh, okay. several blocks away from my school, but never anything, never anything very serious, no. But you see uh, them on the horizon? Was, yeah, I've seen them on the horizon, and my dad was actually in, uh, he was in Oklahoma City, and he was there when that uh, big F5 went through in the 90s. And it actually went through maybe a mile away from the school he teaches at. Yeah. And so he was actually standing out uh, at the door where he normally went outside to smoke a cigarette, watching this massive, you know, mile-wide tornado go by a mile away from him. Uh, until somebody basically dragged him back inside. All the windows in his car were broken, you know, uh, everything was just... You could still drive by there years later, and there was just be a swath of town that was just gone. Wow. Yeah. it's. I mean, it, they're powerful, and they're amazing, and they are something that you should respect and be terrified of. But it's yeah. so interesting to me that 
you know, when it's something that you get used to, a risk that you get used to, how you suddenly take it so much less seriously. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same. I'm up in Yellowknife right now in the Northwest Territories in Canada. And people, there are a lot of things that are here that people don't believe you could possibly get used to. I mean, there's there are bears that walk on my street <laughs> on a yearly basis, you know, and there, <laughs> yeah. um, I had a wolf encounter early this winter on the lake by my, by my house, just this pack of wolves. And, um, oh, wow. but at the same time, yeah, I talked to my friends in Australia and I'm like, I, I cannot imagine like the snakes and the spiders and the, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> just, and it's not like they're, they have like the, nine out of the, you know, ten most venomous everythings. And it's not like they're rare either. They're like, there's a one no. red back spider in like every house on average. It's, <laughs> um, but... Well, didn't they lose like a prime minister to the sea? I mean, what? like, really? their prime minister, I think in the 60s, one of their prime ministers went swimming and was never seen again. Right, oh, so and I think that, the, shark right? the sharks, yeah. Right, the yeah. Like, I think that that's just... It, it, it's just not something that happens. You know, yeah. you don't lose your prime minister to the ocean, but apparently you do. And then, you know, the people living in Spitsbergen where there's just constant uh, polar bear dangers and you just carry a gun all the time and you kind of, at the bank, there's a rack where you put your gun and, you know, please don't bring your gun into the bank. Like, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it's, it is amazing how resilient people are and how much they can get used to. Well, it's, I mean, it's so much about adapt adaptation. You know, yeah. you, whatever is normal suddenly just becomes your normal, and the next thing you know, it doesn't even bother you. Yeah. I mean, I moved up, I moved up to Minnesota six years ago, and had never had, you know, maybe once in my life had experienced a foot of snow on the ground. Oh no way! And last year, last winter, we were having, you know three foot blizzards come through a couple of times, several times, and would have thirty inches of snow on the ground at any given time. And it you know, you get you adapt to it. Um, if you have the infrastructure and you have people used to something, it doesn't matter as much. Um, like I lived in Birmingham, Alabama for two years and down there, you know, a dusting of snow just blurries and the entire city was shut down. And here in Minnesota, we had a 30-inch blizzard, and the next day, the roads were clear, and traffic was going through, and I was talking to my editor at Boing Boing, and she was assuming I was snowed in, and I was watching the buses go by my window. Right. Like, it it was nothing. And I, I wonder whether that's also a facet of the human learning system, where the first few times you encounter something, you have it has your full attention, and then it whatever mm -hmm. things you learn to do, it becomes automatic, and it goes into those lower subconscious centers, and it really is sort of a uniquely human adaptation to that. And there would you know no no animals would necessarily get used to an environment that was so maladapted for them. But yeah, that's an interesting idea. That is an interesting idea that. It's a hot big theory, you. but <laughs> just agree <Right>. with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of theories start out as half big. <laughs> so whether you can <laughs> take out of the evidence to support it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was kind of, I know you've done a lot of research on sleep science recently, and I was just thinking about, you know, how adapting to dangerous situations and the sleep cycle, like I think about during tornado weather, when I was really little, it used to be really difficult for me to sleep knowing that there was a thunderstorm because I would be afraid of when I have to jump up and go to the basement. And over time, like that became not something I was afraid of anymore. And I knew that I would just be woken up by it. And I'm kind of curious about like, you know, how do we adapt our sleep to knowing that we're going to be able to jump up and go right into the proper behavior? It's, it's interesting to look at the, the way that our sleep cycles are. You, you fall 
down into deep, deep sleep, um, slow mm -hmm. wave sleep, where your brain really is, you know, going much slower and much, you know, there's much less going on in there. Um, and there's a little bit of sort of uh, recovery and so on and, and maintenance of cells that happens when that, that um, that activity is lower, so it's more efficient. And then, and then you come up into your REM sleep, which is when you're dreaming and all of that. And that is is very close to a waking profile of um, of brain activity, except that your muscles are paralyzed and you're. Um, and it's thought that it might that might actually be a mechanism that was adapted for fooling you into thinking that you're awake, because ancestrally. Mm -hmm. If you're tending a fire, or you're or you're watching out for predators, or basically, you would have had to get up and look around you every hour or so during the night just to make sure that everything was safe. You you can't really afford to be asleep completely for the whole night. So, and I think in many societies, people probably still do that. Is you you have this periodic waking time where you just kind of poke your head around and make sure that, you know, everyone's safe and, and, um, and there's no dangers in your environment, and then you go back to sleep. Uh, so when we're in these stressful situations or these dangerous situations, I think we kind of revert to that a little bit. Um, and certainly people can, if they know they have to wake up really soon, they, they tend to do that. They tend to, like, kind of go into these shorter sleeps and then keep checking the clock and all that. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And it also actually reminds me, and this is somewhat off topic, but um, several years ago I heard about a sleep theory that I have been wanting to ask you about uh, because I have no idea whether it's actually true. Okay. But that um, the idea was that older civilizations like the Greeks and uh, pre Three Greeks had a period of time in the night where everybody would wake up at like two o'clock in the morning and hang out for a couple of hours and like have another meal and then go back to sleep again. That and there was true. like this natural rhythm to human beings waking up in the middle of the night and then going back to sleep. Is that actually something that's real or is that? It's so real like, and it happens in experiments oh, really? too. Yeah. And I, I love talking about it as well because it's like, I see it as an anti-nap that it's just like, it's a bizarre <laughs> practice that, um, but it, and it seems to have a basis also in our physiology. So if you hmm. put people under the conditions where there's say 14 hours of darkness and eight hours of Wait, does that work out? Uh, 14. 12, <laughs> 16 hours, 14 hours of darkness and eight, 10 hours of light? There we go. Um, that sounds about right. <laughs> then, which is something that could happen in this sort of winter situation in a temperate zone. Then, mm -hmm. but with no artificial light, so they have to have that darkness. Then they fall into this, this, uh, this, pattern of sleeping where they will fall asleep shortly after dark like that would be uh that would be dusk and then mm -hmm. they they wake up around say midnight and they have this period of yeah like you said two hours but it's more it's not really getting up and running around it's more kind of a meditative quiet in bed um, and then they'll fall asleep again and wake up around dawn. But what's really interesting to me is the biological underpinnings of this, because when you look at their hormonal levels, you see this surge of prolactin during that time. And it's not something that modern sleep allows for. You, you do see prolactin rise, but you don't see this kind of spike that you get during that period of meditative quiet. And prolactin, we associate that with um, breastfeeding and so on, and that's you know, okay. and it and it really is involved in that. But it's also involved in um, in sex and in uh, orgasm, mm -hmm. and it's basically you. People describe it as this sort of body buzz, kind of contented um, period of wakefulness, where and you see records of this in medieval times and and even later when they didn't really have access to much artificial light if if they weren't rich um and it was very common to to wake up and have this sort of prayerful time maybe with your spouse pray for your kids uh 
um, futures and and all all the people around you and have this kind of um, visiting time with the family before you go back to bed. Hmm. That is so fascinating and so interesting. Yeah, there's been a lot I of people... I think it also ends up... Yeah, I'm sorry. There's been a lot of people who have um, written to me and told me that based on my telling them this, that they, you know, they're going to experiment on this for themselves or that they naturally have that rhythm and they're so glad that they're not total weirdos for having it. <laughs> um, but I, myself, I mean, I kind of resent those eight hours that are taken from my day anyway, so I haven't actually tried it. Um, but they do tell me that um, some of these subjects experience, really, really they, they realize that they're experiencing true wakefulness for the first time when they're actually when they're actually awake after sleeping like this and, and having that two-hour meditative quiet, they they feel more awake than they ever have. And I would love to experience hmm. that. That's interesting. Because mm. I know that like when I have gone camping or um, gone uh, like been in a situation where I haven't had artificial light, yeah. you, know, you fall asleep like, basically not very long after it gets dark out, you know, I'm asleep by nine or something. For sure, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> right, and, but I do notice that, like, I wake up very briefly in the middle of the night, much more than I do okay. when I'm at home. And it's not, like, I've never had, like, the experience of, like, you know, wondrous bliss from it, but uh, it's definitely been something that I've noticed, that in those situations... Yeah, it's hard to My tease out the confounds up. with the camping situation yeah. where maybe you've been canoeing all day and maybe you're a little bit nervous right. about your environment. And um, But that could well be, you know, the basis behind it. Well, I think it also is really interesting in that it kind of goes back to that people adapting to situations thing because, you know, we got artificial light and it completely changed the way we sleep and in some ways, culture. Yeah, we've colonized the night. So we basically yeah. carry these bubbles around with us, whether it's in our cars with our headlights or in, you know, in spaceships or just around us uh, in our office buildings. And it's always mid-afternoon in May when you're inside. So we, we do carry sort of this different time zone with us just by the fact that we create our environments now. Yeah, which which leads me to another question. Does the temperature affect, like artificial temperature affect sleep the way artificial light does? Temperature can certainly interfere with sleep. Um, basically, your your body internally, um, the, the main component of circadian rhythms really is body temperature, and it rises throughout mm -hmm. the day, and then it falls really sharply just before sleep. And so anything that's going to interfere with that, so for example, if you have an argument with your partner and and it gets you really, like there's adrenaline associated and your body temperature goes up, it's going to be really hard to fall asleep until that calms down. Um, hmm. Conversely, if you have a really hot shower and you come out of it and your body temperature drops from like no longer being in that hot shower, then you might feel really sleepy and dopey, and that might be because it, it fools your body into thinking that it's bedtime. Interesting. So That's cool really environments is, are, are ideal, really, for sleep, because it allows your body temperature to fall in the way that it naturally would. Hmm. That's really cool. Um, I... Also, again, I have my brain has a tendency to go completely and utterly off topic. I remember <laughs> There's no such thing on blogging heads, is there? Oh, well, that's a good point. You know, it just it makes it hard for them to organize the list of, uh, <laughs> of topics. <laughs> what we're talking about, probably. Um, I, I remembered back to you talking about, like, the earth, like, almost having this feeling of when you had that earthquake experience, like, mm. well, this is like this living thing. Yeah. It's just moving so much more slowly than I'm aware of most of the time. Um, reminded me of some of the stuff that the researchers I talked to for that um, climate change and earthquake story were telling me about how the effects of Ice Age glaciers on North America were not done with those effects yet. That the Hudson Bay in Canada is just this divot that happened because of the weight of the glacier, but 
now that the glacier has been gone for thousands of years, it's still rebounding slowly. Right. And eventually there won't be a Hudson Bay, it'll just be a plain. But there's all these little earthquakes that happen in that part of Canada that they believe you can attribute to this land under Hudson Bay just kind of slowly popping back up again, mm. which is fascinating to me. I mean, it's just this entire cycle of existence that happens on such a long scale that we can hardly have any role in it whatsoever. It is, and, it, and it's also it's exciting because it suggests that you could work backwards from what you're seeing now to find out everything that happened right. in the past because it's all echoing, and in the same way that kind of the cosmic radiation from the Big Bang. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And they were actually telling me that there is, um, there's a theory that's not proven yet, but a theory that that is why you also get earthquakes in the center of the North American continent, like along the New Madrid Fault, because it's still rebounding from the weight distribution changes of the end of the Ice Age. Wow. Yeah. So, Which is wow. just so, astounding. And what is, when you say still, is there... Is there a projected point where it would start bouncing, bouncing back down, or how? What time scale are we talking about then? I, you know, and I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, just, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that ever, anybody knows the answer to that. Just that it is. You know, there are still these changes that are happening on the surface of the Earth that they think are because glaciers sat there for thousands of years and then went away. Right. Yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah, I just it's it's completely fascinating to me. And I have um you know, it, it makes it makes the earth seem so much more dynamic to know that there's all these things happening underneath of your feet that you aren't aware of. Um I I just think it's an amazing, amazing part of reality that we don't notice. Yeah, and it also strikes me as one of the few areas that humans really haven't had an impact. I mean, we don't, we've, we've been able to have measurable effects on so many things. And I mean, luckily we haven't redistributed the weight of the planet <laughs> to such an extent, although I guess indirectly, right. With the, you know, global warming and the ice melting, maybe, maybe that's exactly well, what and, and the dams. On. What's that? And, well, and, and the reservoirs, I mean, to a smaller extent. We've okay. Right. Reservoirs. Yeah. Reservoirs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, up, I mean, up here, the, the the global change effects are, I mean, it's just so obvious that um, I would invite anyone who's having any doubts about it just, just to come up here and talk to anyone or, or see for themselves because it's just, it's such an, it's such an, a real and existent and present problem. Um, where are you, and you're in, where are you at again? You're in Montana? No, I'm up in the Northwest Territories in Canada. Oh, okay. So, okay. subarctic. Sub wow. And um, basically, you know, the traditional knowledge right n now is being kind of devalued because it's uh, it's no longer true that the caribou come through at a certain place every year no. because now that's been shifted north. Or um, we have ice roads that go up to the diamond mines that are no longer reliable. And um, it just, it's, it's so... And, species shifting north um very very obviously i mean it's just it, it just blows my mind when people say oh no you know it's like it's uh it's along the same lines as has been happening all the time it's you know it's garbage as you right. know it's garbage but <laughs> right well yes yeah um i like i think i've noticed it a lot more living up here in minnesota also or at least knowing minnesota as i know it compared to how my in-laws knew it when they were younger and compared to the things I have read about people's experiences in this part of the country, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, there's, we've been, my sister-in-law lives in Bayfield, Wisconsin, which is a little peninsula out into Lake Superior. And there's a chain of islands, uh, they're called the Apostle Islands, that, you know, a hundred years ago, years ago, the ice, like the water in between all of these islands used to freeze and people could walk out to 
you know, even the furthest islands in the middle of winter. And now it's basically the, only the closest islands freeze through to us, to the shore. Uh, and they still freeze through, but not every winter, and only a couple of them rather than this entire network. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that's interesting that even, you know, that far south, you can, you can really, uh, it's, it's within living memory to that degree. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, that's really fascinating to me that there are these little things that you can kind of focus in on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the first time that I really thought about climate change was, I, gosh, it would have been like late high school or early college when I started questioning my own memories, having read like some of the research about like how your brain can kind of change history in your mind. Oh, and then yeah. thinking back, well, you know, when I was little, when I was really, really tiny, I remember having lots of snow all the time. And now I never, like in Kansas, I, it would be really, really rare to get snow in winter. And often you have like 60 degree winters. Yeah. And I went around and started asking my parents, like, am I just... <laughs> thinking the yeah. snowfall was bigger than it was, or has it actually gotten to be less? And it seems that in some parts of Kansas, it's actually gotten to be less snow. You know, I mean, my uncles had a snowmobile in uh, mm. northeastern Kansas when I was little, and I'm not sure what you would do with that. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time now, like, you'd be, like, maybe maybe one couple of days every year you could use it. Wow. Yeah, that's a huge change. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm also curious, like, what, what, how did you end up in the Northwest Territories? Uh, well, I came up here five years ago um, for a job for a magazine, and I was um, just doing writing about all the science that's happening um, up in the Arctic. So... We've got a lot of uh, research stations that are doing very active work. Um, I went up to Eureka High Arctic Weather Station, which is on Ellesmere Island, um, mm -hmm. uh, 86 degrees north. And it was just, uh, it was, I mean, it's just so beautiful and it's incredible the atmospheric work that they're doing there. Um, just as, as polar sunrise hits, they can get some really great um, measurements on, on ozone because it hasn't, um, it hasn't been interfered with by by sunlight for the entire winter. Oh, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's been undisturbed, and you can get a really a really great uh, reading on that to compare to other years. Because as soon as soon as uh, the UV starts hitting again, of course, you generate more ozone. Oh wow, that's fascinating. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it took me all around. Arctic Canada for a long time. We, we covered the, the Yukon and Northwest Territories and Nunavut, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I've just stayed in stayed in the north. Nice, nice, good. It was. It's been lovely to talk to you. Like, yeah, you as well. I, you know, I feel like I could do this again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. A whole other yeah. hour to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely hope we can sometime because it's I, there's I feel like there's so much more I want to know about the sleep science stuff and I can't wait to read your book. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. So cool. Well, great. Uh, thank you again for chatting, and uh, hopefully uh, we can talk again sometime. Okay. Bye, Maggie.